happened is we have moved from lives <coughs> in which we had great uncertainties in our futures. Uh, very few people were even secure to know that they would have food uh, three months from now. To now in the, in the Americas and uh, America and Europe, most people are pretty secure in their lives. Uh, and they're afraid of anything that might take that security away. Part of that security is their health, and they're very afraid of anything that might threaten their health. So they're very vulnerable to the secondhand smoke message. They, you know, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm trying, to, I can live to be 125 if nobody ever breathes near me. And so when the public health messengers come and say, her smoke over there is going to hurt you, people right away jump on it. And they're willing to give up their liberty because they want the security. And that's very, very <laughs> scary because eventually then you really do wind up with no liberty at all because there always will be people who are looking to take it away little bits, little bits at a time for their own advantage. I had forgotten, I had one more slide I wanted to put up. It's a quote from uh, an American Supreme Court Justice where he says, oppression does not come all at once. It's kind of like nightfall. Before it comes, you have a twilight. And in that twilight, things kind of look like they're being the same, just little bits of changes here and there at the edges. But if you don't stop it right at those edges, it comes in completely, and then it's too late. Uh, we all know that you can get cancer, cancer from smoking. Oh, sorry. Um, but somewhere I've read sometime that you, when you smoke, you don't get an other numerous diseases. Is that true? You understand? What <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 yes, I think so. Be because but when it is a lie, we need them. <laughs> I think there are some diseases that are negatively correlated with smoking. So if you smoke, you are less likely to get something like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, ulcerative colitis is another disease, I believe, that uh, smoking seems to protect against. Uh, I have often thought that the, the, the disease called multiple chemical sensitivity, those are the people who are allergic to everything. I never heard of a smoker having multiple chemical sensitivity. <laughs> And I am sure that if there was any connection at all, I would have heard about it. So I think maybe the connection is the opposite. Maybe smoking protects against it. I mean, yeah, but I think there is a serious point with that because people with so-called mul multiple chemical sensitivity are, are hypochondriacs. I mean, there's no other word for it. It's, 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 it's not a serious disease. Virtually no medical authority believe it to be a serious disease. Um, they're just another bunch of very strident people who are convinced that they have this interesting neurosis. Um, but the fact that they have, they've had it and people in, in previous generations didn't have it, I think is, is significant because th th things like secondhand smoke actively encourage people to fear trace quantities of things that believe to be toxic. It teaches people to, to believe that something that they physically have a mild you know, dislike of is actually going to kill them. Um, Third-hand smoke does the same thing. In a responsible society, the medical establishment would be the first people to stand up and say there is nothing to worry about here, this is medieval superstition. Unfortunately, in the case of second and third-hand smoke, they have completely failed to do that because it happens to, to fit into their political program. Um, they might think that the, the benefits of having smoking bans outweighs the, the negative of having a few more hypochondriacs around. 
But that is what's going to happen, is you will have more hypochondriacs. You will have people who live in a state of terror um, about a carpet that a smoker has once trod on. You know, this is not a healthy development for society as a whole. Whatever the benefit may be to the, a nation's health, which I would say would be negligible anyway, uh, would be far outweighed by the, the damage to the, uh, the nation's mental health. so sanitised, but they're being very trendy, and they say, and on comes the, the on, over the headphones comes something like Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf. And it's going over, and he says to her, um, gosh, don't you remember this record when we in the Summer of Love? What a great time we had with it, you know? And she says, oh, he says, it's wonderful, isn't it? What do you want to eat? And he says, I really fancy the steak. She says, no, no, you got bad cholesterol. Born to be wild, get your motor running. Um, well, I was thinking I'd have a glass of wine. Well, you know, the doctor told you too many about her. This is a really good record. It's born to be wild. <laughs> yeah, and, and then it goes, and then he goes, uh, hell, is that a person smoking over there? I might die now. And, you know, and, it, and then it goes on, the record goes on. And this is the kind of complete paradox you've got. You've got, you've got things like rock and roll and, and this type of music being pumped out in these type of establishments now. They're the complete antithesis of the actual culture in which they what evolves is dirty. Yet these people are under the delusion, a delusionary state, that they are living in this clinical environment where Pink Floyd or Steppenwolf or anything that they've ever listened to is just as relevant now as it, is, as it was then. It isn't. They're just deluding themselves. And, and to many of us, if I go into those environments and listen to that kind of music, it just lost all its quality because the environment which I'm listening to it, it, it in is completely wrong. And I had to work out, walk out of a Ruby Turner conference, uh, concert once because it was in that kind of environment. And it, had, it just was completely, just, I just, it had no color whatsoever. I think the fundamental reason why we cannot have um, a balanced debate about the true costs of tobacco, um, of smoking, um, uh, or whether there might be, for some people, some benefits um, from smoking, is that the debate, using the word loosely, is no longer about public health. Um, policymakers term it about public health when it's actually about winning votes, or probably in more cases than not, not losing votes. And on the tobacco control movement side, it's said to be about public health, but let's be realistic about it. It's not about public health, it's about how do we get the tobacco industry. Okay, I'm sure that most tobacco control individuals uh, would like to see fewer smokers, and they um, genuinely uh, are concerned about the health of their, their fellow man and woman. But they are driven on a daily basis by their hatred for the tobacco industry. And until we, I think, publicly recognize what's, what are the dynamics and what are the motivations and incentives, both for policymakers and the tobacco control movement, um, we're never going to get to that place where we can actually lay the evidence on the table and have it rationally debated. Because the people we'd like to debate with are not interested in the debate because they're on a mission, they're on a campaign, they have an agenda. And um, that agenda is either staying in power or attempting to destroy the tobacco industry. Either or both of those goals may or may not be worthy ones, but they have nothing to do with public health. 